World War II was a time of intense turmoil in Europe. During this time, a select few were chosen to carry out dangerous but critical clandestine work. One woman, Virginia Hall, stepped up and took on a dangerous job as an agent in Nazi-occupied France. During her years working for the British SOE in the United States OSS, Virginia Hall's successful leadership led to a lasting legacy as one of the most dangerous spies of World War II. Over the course of American history, women have played an important role in espionage during wartime. Especially in the American Revolution, young female cooks and maids were employed to spy on the British because of their stereotypically harmless appearance. Because of their gender, women were able to participate as spies and not be as suspect as men were. So their gender really helped them out. During World War I, women were recruited by the military as mostly radio operators or decoders. There were many great American female spies, but one of the best was yet to come. Virginia Hall was born in Baltimore, Maryland on April 6, 1906. The youngest daughter of a wealthy real estate agent, she grew up as a tomboy, enjoying hunting, horseback riding, and fishing. Virginia was an intelligent and outgoing student. In addition to excelling in her schoolwork, she participated in sports, school plays, and was her class president. After her graduation from Roland Park Country Day School, she moved on to attend Harvard's Radcliffe College and Columbia's Barnard College, before studying abroad at the École des Sciences Politiques in Paris. She was very tall and she was very attractive, and she came from a well-to-do background. Virginia had dreams of becoming a foreign service officer because of her fluency in French and German and love of Europe. She applied for the job but failed the exam twice despite perfect scores on the foreign language portion both times she took the test. After being turned down, she moved to Warsaw, Poland and secured a job as a consular service clerk at the American Embassy. She was determined to get a job in the foreign service field. When her heart was broken by her Polish love interest, she insisted that she be transferred to the American Embassy in Smyrna, Turkey, and she was sent there soon after. On December 8, 1933, Virginia and her friends went on a hunting outing in Turkey, and a tragedy struck that would change the direction of her life forever. While climbing over a fence, her rifle misfired and the pellets hit her left foot. She was rushed to the nearest hospital, but by the time she arrived, the infection had already set in and her left leg had to be amputated below the knee for her to survive. Virginia received a prosthetic wooden leg, which she affectionately nicknamed Cuthbert. Less than a year after the incident, Virginia was working as a clerk at the American Embassy in Venice, Italy. I think she was determined for it not to affect her negatively, so I think in trying to overcome it, it helped her. Disgruntled by what she called her twin handicaps, being an amputee and being a woman, she left her job at the embassy in May 1939 and traveled to Paris. When France declared war on Germany on September 3, 1939, Virginia decided to take action and enlist in the French ambulance service as an ambulance driver. She worked around the clock for weeks at a time, witnessing the injustice and crimes against humanity committed by the Nazis. When France surrendered to Nazi Germany, her unit was disbanded, so she traveled to London where she presented herself at the embassy. She debriefed the employees on the situation in France. The U.S. Defense Attaché's office hired her immediately as a code clerk to help decrypt messages. This work bored her, and she felt as if she was not doing enough to directly help the people suffering in occupied France. At a party that Virginia attended, she was introduced to a woman named Vera Atkins, who, after speaking with Virginia for a while, recruited her to be an agent for the British Special Operations Executive, or SOE. Based on her excellent grasp on languages and courage and physical endurance, Virginia passed through the SOE's intense training program with flying colors. In her preliminary training, she was instructed in demolition, signaling, and combat. She excelled at knife combat. In the paramilitary training that followed, she was taught how to kill silently, use Morse code, and use explosives. You had to learn how to be deceptive. You had to learn how to blend in. She had to blend in, and that's what I, I've never been able to understand how she could blend in with a wooden, partial wooden leg, but somehow she managed to do it. 
Before long, Virginia was ready. She officially signed on to the SOE on April 1, 1941, and was sent into the field in Vichy, France. She became the first female agent to be sent into France by the SOE and was codenamed Germaine. She was going undercover as a reporter for the New York Times, Brigitte Le Contre. During her incredible 15 months in the field, her job was to help the French underground resistance gain power. She organized, supplied, armed, and trained the soldiers of the French resistance. She rescued downed Allied agents and oversaw their safe return into London. She mapped safe places to drop supplies by parachute for the resistance. She helped to coordinate the escapes of prisoners of war from camps and prisons and acted as a connection between the networks of SOE agents working in France. She did all of this while managing to uphold her cover by writing regular articles for the New York Times and by evading the notorious Butcher of Lyon, Gestapo commander Klaus Barbie. The Gestapo had caught on to the fact that La Dame qui boit, or the limping lady, distinguished by her slight limp caused by the prosthetic, was one of the masterminds behind the French underground resistance. She quickly rose to the top of the Gestapo's most wanted list. Codenamed Artemis by the Gestapo, her wanted poster read, the woman who limps is one of the most dangerous allied agents in France. We must destroy her. Being forced to flee to Spain in order to escape the Gestapo, Virginia hiked by foot over the Pyrenees Mountains in the dead of winter of 1942. For a normal person, this task would have been incredibly difficult, but for a person with only one leg, it was a nearly impossible feat. When she reached Spain after her taxing ordeal, she was imprisoned for her lack of proper documentation required in order to enter the country. After her release, she remained in Madrid as a spy for the SOE since it was too dangerous for her to go back to France. In Madrid, she coordinated a network of safe houses but soon got bored. She transferred back to London where she was treated as a hero and was offered the Order of the British Empire Award for her work, which she turned down for fear of jeopardizing her cover. Virginia was frustrated with the SOE for not allowing her to re-enter the field in France, so she quit the SOE and joined the United States Office of Strategic Services, or OSS. Codenamed Diane by the OSS, she was sent back into France via torpedo boat in 1944. Disguised as an old woman in order to normalize her limp, she mapped parachute drops and regularly radioed information to the Allies. As the date for D-Day drew nearer, Virginia trained three battalions of resistance forces in guerrilla warfare. On June 6, 1944, the date of D-Day, Virginia and her forces went about destroying bridges and phone lines, derailing trains, and capturing enemy soldiers in order to hinder the Nazi line of retreat from the beaches of Normandy. During one of her coordinated parachute drops of agents into France, she met OSS agent Paul Gia as he dropped from the sky. It was love at first sight, but there was more important work to be done. Virginia continued to carry out her critical work while hiding out in barns and safe houses around France. Paris was liberated on August 25, 1944, and Virginia was brought back to the United States soon after. She was honored as a hero, and on September 23, 1945, Virginia made history as the first civilian woman to be awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. In a small, secretive ceremony, only attended by Virginia's mother for fear of blowing her cover, she received the award humbly. She then joined the CIA, which had just been created at the time. In 1956, she became the first woman to become a career member of the CIA. In 1950, she married Paul Guillot, the OSS agent that she had met while working in France and lived with him in Maryland. After her forced retirement from the CIA at age 60, she settled down on her farm in Barnstown, Maryland, where she raised French poodles, gardened religiously, watched birds from her porch, and read through spy novels constantly. Virginia Hall passed away on July 12, 1982 in Maryland, at the age of 76. Virginia Hall may not have spoken much of her time as an influential spy in World War II, but her legacy remains. In 1988, she was inducted into the Military Intelligence Corps Hall of Fame. In 2006, Virginia's niece received in Virginia's name the Order of the British Empire, the award that she had turned down in 1943. At the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C., there are two exhibits dedicated to her work, containing artifacts from her time on enemy lines. Her courageous leadership led to a successful mission on D-Day, the most influential date of the war. Virginia Hall's daring and selfless work for the Allied forces and the people of France will forever be remembered by intelligence workers for her leadership and lasting legacy.